praise. Salvation and glory, honor and power. All praise is to our great God and King. Thank God for the choir. Hallelujah. Blessing that wonderful, glorious name of Jesus. He is worthy to be praised. Worthy to be praised. That's why we're here. Praise his holy name. Praise him to worship him. I also ask, um, just mentioning some prayer requests. Please be in prayer for Sister Swafford. She's going to be leaving this weekend, next weekend. Son Nakia. Next Monday, son Nakia Swafford will be having surgery. In prayer for our dear brother, of course, his precious, precious mother. Amen. As she travels, go and help take care of her son. Amen. It's also great to see Brother Delandis and his precious wife. Yes, it is. This morning. I asked him to sing, but he said no. <laughs> it's always good to see family. Okay. Also, the um, no, the the copy that I mentioned to you um, for those who are may have raised their eyebrows and said, uh, pastor's not paying attention to copyright laws. Uh, those are available free at crossway.org, okay? So that's why I offer you my copy, <laughs> a copy of mine, okay? Um, I got that free, so it, it wasn't me copying from the book, all right? It's available free at crossway.org, all right? <laughs> Good understanding makes good relationships, you know that? <laughs> Page six of your programs is our responsive reading for the Word of God that we will preach today. Deacon Mike Long was not able to be here today. Uh, to the holidays, he had to be in Dallas this today, as well as Deacon Danny Pass. I, I, I think, however, however we do it, I think Mike is being brought in right by phone or something. I, I know I saw his face on the phone in Sunday school. Right, there's Mike, but he wasn't here. But it's great that. He hungers that much for the Word of God that he would ask. He's trying to get all he can. Continue to pray for our brothers as well. Okay, we're in Mark chapter 8. And when did I start, Mark? Praise the Lord. Last year, July of last year? Okay, so. We're set to finish probably in another year. So maybe December of uh, 2019 we'll be done with Mark's Gospel. Key word is maybe. In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd. Because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? <laughs> 
You do remember chapter 6, right? <laughs> now he asked them, how many loaves do you have? They said, seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves. And having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. Together. And, and there were about 4,000 people. And he sent them away. Amen. It's the word of God. Heavenly Father, we bow before you once again in need of grace to help in this time of need. Our need is to hear your word, to hear the Holy Spirit preach your word to us through me, your servant. Yes, Lord. Feel me, Holy Spirit. I only desire to say what you intended to say. I want to expound upon your word, grant your servant knowledge and wisdom to expound and proclaim and declare Christ to your people. I pray for their feeling as well. Open their hearts like you did with Lydia. Open hearts to receive your holy word, to receive the word of Christ, the word of the living God. Save, please. Sanctify, please. Exhort, encourage, instruct, reprove, rebuke. Do all that you do for our good. Bring us more and more into conformity to the very image of Christ. The very goal of our salvation. We want to be more like Christ. We bless your name. We give you glory. We trust your answer to prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The compassionate Savior. The compassionate Savior. Say, Pastor, you just finished talking about his compassion. The last message. Please do not think you learned it all in that message. <laughs> Well, I certainly do not think I learned it all in that message. And after this message, message, I still will not have learned it all. But as I noted in the two previous episodes, the feeding of the 4,000 here is part of a sequence of events involving Jesus' activities among Gentiles in Gentile regions. You remember, after teaching on clean and unclean things, in chapter 7, verses 1 through 23, after that, Jesus cast out a demon. He cast a demon out of the daughter of a Syrophoenician woman, in verses 24 through 30 of chapter 7. Then he turned around and he heals a deaf and mute man in Decapolis in verses 31 through 37 of chapter 7. And now, as he goes farther into Gentile territory, he, he, he feeds a second multitude, <laughs> starting with a few loaves and fish. 
Immediately following this account, the Pharisees, representing Israel's leadership, immediately following this, they will demand a sign from Jesus. And then Jesus will warn his disciples about the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Mark is contrasting Gentile openness with the gospel, to the gospel, excuse me, with Jewish resistance to the gospel. The Jews who had the oracles of God should have recognized the Messiah. The Gentiles who didn't are running to him. Aren't you glad that we have mm -hmm. sure a compassionate Savior? Yes, this second feeding miracle, like the first, it portrays the authoritative Messiah and uh, it, it portrays Jesus, excuse me, as the authoritative Messiah and a compassionate shepherd feeding his people in a wilderness place it's actually a preview of the Messianic banquet. Hmm. Glory. By narrating this second miracle in the Decapolis and placing it in the context of Jesus' interaction with Gentiles, Mark implicitly affirms that the invitation to the Messianic banquet is not for Israelites alone. But thank God, it's for all people everywhere. And remember now, Mark, Mark's audience is Gentile. And remember now, this audience is Gentile. So somebody ought to be glad today that we too get to go to the banquet Thank you, Lord. because of our compassionate Savior. Thank you, Lord. This is a meaty text. I want us to see first, in verses 1, 2, and 3, I want us to see the moving compassion of Christ. The moving compassion of Christ. Note with me verses 1, 2, and 3 again of chapter 8. In those days when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now for, they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. Notice first, the report of his compassion. In those days, that is a uh, chronological reference that points back to the visit to Decapolis in verses 31 and through 37 of chapter 7. So Mark wants us to understand this miracle takes place in predominantly Gentile territory. Note the little word also, again, See that word? This word draws special attention to the fact that this is another instance of a similar event. Mm -hmm. It looks back actually to the feeding of the 5,000 that we've already looked at in chapter 6, verse 34 through 44. Again, Jesus sees a great crowd. Why is the crowd great? Well, you remember all, all of that publicity that Jesus got in chapter 7, verse 36. The zealous public, publicizing of the deaf man that was formerly deaf, that can now hear, that could not talk, that can now talk because of the miraculous power of Christ. So now you have a great crowd. They're drawn to Jesus by his miracles. Jesus is in a pagan region, but 
they give him praise mm -hmm. to the God of Israel. Yes, All right. yeah. The parallel passage is in Mark chapter 15, excuse me, uh, Matthew chapter 15. Matthew is the only one that gives another account of the feeding of the 4,000. Jesus sees this crowd and he reports his compassion to his disciples. Follow me now. He called them to himself. That word called should not be skipped over. The word means to summons. It speaks of Jesus' authority as Lord over his disciples. It means to summons in order to secure one's presence. Jesus summons them to himself. Why? Because he wants to open up his heart to them and let them see his heart for these people. That's why Jesus has gathered you together this morning. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Jesus says, I want you to see my heart for people. Jesus, remember, he's intent on training the 12. He will not perform such a miracle of feeding without first calling their attention to the need and getting their reaction. Follow me. Notice again what he said. I have compassion on the crowd. The gospel writers, if you read the gospels, I think I mentioned this on last uh, Lord's Day, they, they, they continually tell us that Jesus felt compassion toward people. But only here and in the parallel passage in Matthew 15, 32, did Jesus speak in the first person and he declares this about himself. He says, I have compassion on the crowd. We saw, talked about compassion last week. The word comes from a word that means to be moved in one's bowels, the, the instinctive organs where the Feelings of pain are felt. The ancients considered this the seat of emotions. The English word compassion comes from a Latin word that means to, to suffer with and conveys feelings of deep sympathy, deep pity, and kindness toward those who are hurting. Jesus is opening up his heart. Somebody ought, ought to be happy that Jesus yeah. is compassionate. So this means, when he said, I have compassion towards them, this means his heart went out to them. He, he has sympathy, and, but his sympathy is coupled with a desire to help them. He's allowing the disciples to get a glimpse inside of his heart. He says, I see a need, and I'm determined to do something about it. I would argue as well, since throughout the Old Testament, God repeatedly revealed himself as, a, as the God of compassion. I would argue as well that when Jesus says, I have compassion towards them, it's a, yet another argument for his deity. Why do I say that? For example, in Exodus 34, 6, the Lord God declared himself to be compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Moses reiterated that divine attribute to the Israel, Israelites in Deuteronomy 30, excuse me, Deuteronomy 4, 31. Listen to it. For the Lord your God is a compassionate God. He will not fail you, nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant with your fathers, which he swore to them. The psalmist picks it up in Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness. Even when the nation of Israel proved unfaithful, According to 2 Kings 13, 23, the Lord was gracious to them and had compassion on them and turned to them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and would not destroy them or cast them from his presence until now. Right. Praise the Lord. Praise you. Jeremiah said, let me in on it. <laughs> he declared, even after the fall of Jerusalem, Lamentations 3.22, you know, well, well, the Lord's loving, casting, loving kindness indeed never cease, for his compassions 
never failed. When Jesus reports that he has compassion for people, our hearts should rejoice because that's why we are not consumed. I report to you today the heart of our Lord for his people and he is full of compassion. Full of compassion for hurting people like us. He reports that. He reports that. But we also see the reason for his compassion. Verse 2 and 3 again. Because they, were, they, they have been with me now for three days. And have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, and they will faint on the way, and some of them will, and some of them will come from far away. I see at least three reasons that, that Jesus is moved in his heart with compassion. First reason, they've been with them for three days. Don't skip over the word, the little phrase, have been with. That's one word uh, in the Greek language. It speaks of a special adherence and commitment to Jesus. In other words, the crowd had not been coincidentally with him. The crowd had been intentionally with him. Now, if you've been tracking with me through Mark's gospel, this is an unusually positive description of a crowd in Mark. Because usually when we see a crowd, and usually Jesus is among Jewish crowds, usually when we see a crowd, Mark gives us a negative impression of the crowd. But Jesus finds a reception among Gentiles that he has not found among Jews. And their eagerness to hear Jesus' teaching and witness his miracles, the crowd refused to go home. Even if they meant sleeping outside yeah. and missing some meals. Mama. I wonder if I'm talking to anybody like Come that. Come on. Amen. Right. Overwhelmed with the Lord Jesus, they put hunger aside. Jesus recognized what perhaps they didn't even realize. So, First reason, they've been intentionally with me. Follow me, there's some application from, from this. Second reason, they, they have nothing to eat. They've gathered around Jesus because they have deep interest in Jesus. They've stayed longer than anticipated. Their provisions have now been completely exhausted. Uh, their very eagerness to remain with him had brought about their eagerness to remain with him. Their eagerness to remain with him had brought about the condition of need and it touched the heart of Jesus. It's right. the third reason. Jesus is concerned about them fainting if he sends them away hungry. That word faint means to become weary or give out. It is a very expressive term. Literally, it means to be completely unloosed. It suggests that the strength of the hungry people will relax like an unstrung bow and they will be unable to continue homeward. They're going to collapse before they reach home. Some of them have come from very far away. So yeah. the distance between cities and Decapolis was much greater than in the heavily populated Galilee. So Jesus is concerned, is compassionate, is, he's touched in his heart because they've been intentionally with me. They have nothing to eat. And if I send them away, they will not make it home. May I say this? all who are following Christ today and for all who are on the fence mm. our Lord will make sure Hallelujah. that you lack nothing Hallelujah. that you need Hallelujah. following him have a hand warriors here Whatever losses we may incur, uh, whatever hardships we may endure, whatever sacrifices we may be compelled to make because of our faith in, our love for, and our devotion to Him, our Lord, our Master will make sure we're taken care of. We shall lose nothing 
in this world and nothing in the world to come. He promised, beloved. He promised. L listen, for example, to uh, 1 Samuel 2, verse 30. Therefore the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promise that your house and the house of your father shall go in and out before me forever. But now the Lord declares, Far be it from me, for those who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. You honor the Lord, you'll be honored. Praise you, God. Thank you, Lord. Listen to the psalmist in Psalm 34, 10. The young lions suffer want and hunger. Those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Amen. I'm just trying to walk through this, but I, I, my soul is rejoicing right now. Amen. Nobody loses. Nobody loses following Christ. Amen. He always supplies all of our needs according to his riches and glory because he's full of compassion. He is. Thank you, Lord. Is there anybody here intentionally with him? <laughs> I'm talking about by faith. You're trusting in Jesus Christ. That, and faith is belief plus commitment. So you're following Christ. You are a disciple of Christ. Don't worry about what you need. Amen. Matthew chapter 6. Amen. Jesus says, be like the little bird. They don't worry. I take care of them. And you are much more valuable. So we see then the moving compassion of Christ. That's why we keep in bliss. Oh, yes. May I say it this way as well? That's why I'm not worried about Matthew, Ernest, and Anita. And the family. Because I know the compassion of Christ yes. will meet the need. Amen. Amen. <laughs> yes, sir. Listen, that's just how he is. Oh, may I say it even better? That's just who he is. It's the God of compassion. Second, We see not only the moving compassion of Christ, but we see the masterful testing of Christ. Now watch this. And his disciples answered him, verse 4 and 5, and his disciples answered him, How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? They said, seven. Something ought to startle you about verse four. Yes, sir. Something ought to shake you about verse four. Yes, sir. Note two things about his masterful testing. First of all, and that's what Jesus is doing here with his disciples. Remember, they're in training. Okay? Jesus' test revealed the disciples' doubtful conclusion. Jesus' test revealed the disciples' doubtful con conclusion. He lets them see his heart. He unveils his heart he says he can't send them home. He says they don't have anything to eat. He says they ran out of food because they're intentionally with me. So he says, I'm going to do something about it. And his disciple says, I can want to feed these people with bread in this desolate place. Buckle up, there could be some turbulence along the way. Jesus' test revealed the disciples' doubtful conclusion. Now, the disciples clearly see that the Lord 
has compassion, compassion and wants to feed the crowd. Yes. This bewildered counter question of theirs indicated that they recognized the need as being utterly beyond any ordinary means available. Now, beloved, I, you know, I read commentators on this that really just tried to bail the disciples out. Anytime you interpret scripture, you, you better make sure you keep it in context. Because later on in, in chapter 8, Jesus is going to talk about them being, their hearts being hard, them being dull of hearing. That kind of, that, that's not there for, for nothing. My, my. Okay. Amen. Stay with me. I'm going somewhere. They say this is a desolate place. So, any thought of going to buy food in this desolate place is out of the question. Right? We can't buy any food here. In the parallel account, uh, Matthew uses uh, the pronoun we when they speak. The disciples are thinking of themselves and, and their bewildered question. They realize that the people need a good meal before leaving, but but uh, uh, they're not able to supply. How can anyone eat these people with bread here in this desolate place? Anyone? Including the Son of God? Including the man who proved himself able before? Here's what they should have said. Yes. Lord, here's seven laws. Yes. We're going to give these laws. We're going to go get some extra baskets. Because we know you're able. You, you are. You are Yahweh, Jara, the God who provides. We believe what you said in the last feeding miracle that you are indeed the bread of life. You are the great I am. We will trust you and we will follow your instructions just as you were able before you can do it today. Hallelujah. That's what they should have said. Yes, sir. Should Amen. But that's not what they said. Nope. You know what this miracle reminds us? Don't beat up on them now. That's right. Don't, 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 don't get too far ahead of yourself. Don't, don't get super spiritual on right now. Jesus brought them through a trial like this before. That's right. Right? They face it again and they say, what are they going to bring? The bread of life is standing before them. The great I am is there. The, the Jehovah Jireh is there. And they're saying, what are we going to get bread? You know what this miracle reminds us? Yes. We are people of little faith. Yes. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. It, only, it had only been a few months that they saw Jesus take two fish and five loaves and feed 5,000 men plus women and children. And they still doubted when the problem arose. We're the same way. Amen. I, I, yeah, they they should have said, don't worry. Yes. Just sit, sit back and watch him reach into heaven's oven and produce bread and fish for every one of you and, and plenty to spare. We hope you're hungry because Jesus is about to spread the table and it'll be full. Amen. But don't we have a, the capacity to often forget yes. God's goodness? Yes, sir. You know we do. We've experienced God's goodness in times past, but we don't draw the right conclusions from his kindness. Isn't that right? It is as if they had never seen Jesus provide. They forget to ask him for relief. Right? See, God brings us through so much and he has brought us through so much and he has done so much and his goodness has been so overwhelmingly beautiful and so overwhelmingly rich in his power he has demonstrated over and over and over again but we go through things and we forget to contemplate his power. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I wish I had somebody in here. 
And when you forget to contemplate his power, meditate on his goodness, you, 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 you find yourself losing the benefit of living by the Lord's power and living by the Lord's love. They should have taken what they learned a few months ago and applied it to what they're going through now. You and I should take past blessings and what God taught us instead of just rejoicing and saying how good he is, but we have not stopped to meditate and to contemplate on what he did and what he was doing and to learn lessons, then another trial comes. And we're just like the disciples. We're going to get bread. How many times? This is just uh, for your personal application. How many times has the Lord come through for you? Go ahead and start counting. How many times has God moved a mountain for you? Go ahead and start counting. How many times has God brought you through a battle? How many times when it seemed like there was no way that God actually made a way out of nowhere? And how many times have you and I doubted when the next trial came? Oh, we people of small faith, you know what Thank God for a compassionate Savior. Oh, thank God. There's not one word of rebuke in this passage. Not only is he extremely compassionate and full of compassion, he's full of patience. Wow! They have the audacity to ask, where are we going to get bread in this desolate place? I'm glad God is not like us. And I'm going to step back and say, excuse me? Did, did I just see you ask something about <laughs> You forgot who? Moi? <laughs> you forgot who you're walking with here. Amen. Not one word for you. He's just so good. Yes. Lord. He's just so good to us. So this test revealed the, the disciples' doubtful conclusion. And you know, beloved, before I go to this second point concerning his masterful testing, Make sure we don't think too highly of ourselves than we are. Yes. Sometimes we think we're farther along than we think. Then the Lord will bring a test, and that test will reveal that you thought you were down the road, you're still back here at the fence. <laughs> right? Make sure you understand that. Jesus has to bring us along. Second thing about the test I want you to see, just masterful. Jesus is just masterful in his testing. Jesus' test required an inventory challenge. They said what they said. He asked them, how many loaves do you have? They said, seven. So Jesus' question, notice now, his question turned the attention of the disciples to their own resources. His question implied that you need to get involved with what you have. <laughs> they said seven. That's all. According to Matthew, they had a few little fish. According to uh, the seventh verse, they had some fish, right? Seven loaves, a few fish. Listen, beloved. It is our responsibility to use everything God puts in our hands for the work he gives us opportunity to do for the souls of men and the glory of his name. I believe I'll say that one more time. It is our responsibility 
to use everything God puts in our hands for the work he gives us opportunity to do for the souls of men in the glory of his name. So God, Christ is asking you that question. What do you have? Now, if the work we're doing is God's work, watch this. Yes, sir. Don't miss this. If you sleep, wake up. <laughs> if the work you're doing is God's work, Amen. Amen. it doesn't matter if you have much or little. Amen. Amen. It's all the same to him. <laughs> right? Because whatever you have, whatever you bring to the table, Jesus has to turn your inadequacy into adequacy. So if you're sitting there and say, I only have little, bring it. Jesus uses little. Amen. You say, but I have much, it's still inadequate. Bring it. Amen. It's all the same to him. Jesus uses our inadequacy and turns it into adequacy. Amen. So what do you have this morning? Are you, are you holding it? Or will you place it in his hands? We use it for his glory. We use it in his service. Amen. I want you to learn something else from, from Jesus here. He's such a teacher, isn't he? We've been teaching on discipleship on Wednesday through the Mark's Gospel. Um, Brother Chris and I will continue that on Wednesday in the new year. I want you to think about discipleship. Jesus taught and trained and, and he repeated. Those three things he did with his disciples, taught, trained, and repeated. Now teaching is uh, communicating information so that the truth is passed from one who knows it to the one who needs to learn it, right? So teaching strengthens the learner's mind, but training challenges the learner's life, right? Teaching leads to training, which provides opportunity for practical hands-on application, right? Then there's repetition. Mm -hmm. Now, repetition is the mother of learning. Young people don't miss this. Our brains repeated exposure to information is desperately needed. Actually, the secret of memory is no secret at all. It's just review, review, review. Right? We don't remember because we don't review, review, review. Yeah. Right? You just finished exams, young people. What if every day you came home from school and reviewed what you learned that day? And then reviewed again the next day and reviewed again the next day. By the time the exam time came, you would not have had to try to cram and learn a bunch. Because you review, review, review. And when you review, it gets locked into your memory. Stored there. Amen. All right, that's for school. Right? So the great example here is the Lord. You remember, you remember what he did now? He appointed 12 people. 12 men, right? Yes. Why? He wanted them to be with him. We already saw that in chapter 3. That's teaching. And then he was sending them out to preach. What's that? That's training. And, and, and he will put them to the test and, 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 and they will remain with him and they will be responsible to continue his mission and then he will bring them to situations that were similar and teach them the same thing that he had taught them before. That's repetition. That's what we are this morning. Jesus is repeating he brings them to a similar, almost exact incident, except it's in Gentile territory, and repeat something. Don't ever come to the scriptures. This is what I seek to practice in my own life. Don't come to the scriptures as if you know a passage that you've learned before. But one thing, what you have learned you need to repeat and continue to learn. And as you repeat and continue to learn, you're going to learn more. 
right? We need repetition, don't we? We need the truth locked in our memory, locked in our brains, locked there so that, so, so that we can continue to call up the word of God and apply the word of God by wisdom, his wisdom, in our lives. This might hurt a little bit. One of our problems, we waste too many sermons. Listen, I, I appreciate encouragement. But if you really want to encourage me, talk to me about what you're learning, how you're applying the word, word of God. Because if you give me a pat on the back, I in turn got to point to the one who actually did it. Our glory goes to him. I appreciate the encouragement. I appreciate if you say you're blessed through the preaching of God's word. But if you want to encourage my heart, talk to me about how you're applying it. Talk to me about how you're talking to your family. Right? I was talking to a good friend of mine sitting here in this service this morning that was talking to me about discipleship and how he's seeking to apply it. What is he learning? I had to get off the phone. Because I was about to I was about to just lose my mind and rejoice with tears right there. That's what I'm talking about. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Here he is. Just a marvelous testing, isn't it? Jesus says, I gave you the answer to the test before. Here's the test again. When you love, when you love that young people, you took one test took a couple of months ago, got all the answers right there. You got them all. If you took notes, you got them all written down and said, okay, here's, here's another test. Just like that one. Well, they flunked. How does Jesus deal with people who flunk? You know, like us. Well, look at verse 6 through 9, the miraculous provision of Christ. What did he do? Note verse 6 and 7. Well, note verse 6 first. And he, and he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground and he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd. Go ahead, verse 7. And they had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. In the miraculous provision, first of all, we see the command before the provision. He commands everybody to sit down, to recline. That's a definite act on the ground. Sit down. He doesn't talk about green grass this time, like he did in chapter 6, verse 39. Months has passed since the feeding of the 5,000. It's dry and it's hot. They're on the hills. They're sitting down. Why do they need to sit down, Jesus? Well, because there's order to his power. There's order to what he's doing, right? He didn't just throw power out and have people pushing and shoving, trying to get some food. No, 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 no. Everybody sit down. That's more order to what I'm doing. I'm going to have you sit down and we're going we're, we're gonna to pass it out because there's order to God. God is the God of order. Right? Then, there's obedience to this command, right? He says, sit down. They sit down. Right? <laughs> you want to experience his blessing? You have to obey his word. You want to get fed? You need to sit down. And spiritually, we need to do that. God, God has to tell us sometimes, sit down. <laughs> sit down so I can bless you. Yes, sir. Right? Just going, going, going. Sit down. Yes, sir. You're right. You're doing the Martha thing. I need you to do the Mary thing. Sit down at my feet. They obeyed his command. But also, not only do you see the command before his provision, you see the creating for the provision. He took seven loaves, he had to give them thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. They set them before the people, and they had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said, he said that these also should be set before the people. He gave thanks. That's the first thing he did, right? Yes, sir. I mean, that means he blessed God. 
He gave thanks before he multiplied the food, before the miracle he gave thanks. Do you see something here that Jesus might want to teach us? First he gave thanks for what he had. Amen. Yes. See, sometimes you got to focus on what you have. Yes, sir. Not on what you do not have. And you honor God and complain less. Y'all didn't hear me, did you? First of all, he took what he had, focused on what he had, and he thanked God, he blessed God for what he had. Look what happens next. He broke them and gave to his disciples to set before the people. That word broke. Don't miss this, okay? A little grammar, but don't miss it. It's some grammar that you need. Broke is aorist tense. It denotes the definite act. He broke it. Gave is imperfect tense. What that means, he broke it, but he kept on giving. Man, you're going to be driving home and say, Aris and perfect. Wait a minute. It was only seven laws, right? A few fish, right? But he broke. And after he broke number seven, he kept on getting it. How do you break? And all this ran out. But you keep on giving. You need to stay with me right now. In other words, what he willed in his heart kept coming into being in his hands. <laughs> We're not talking about magic. We're talking about what he willed in his heart. And there's no human explanation for this other than he willed it in his heart and it kept coming into being in his hands. Who is this? This must be that John 1-1 one, one guy. Amen. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. Yes, sir. This must be that Genesis 1-1 one, one person. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He creates ex nihilo out of nothing. Who am I talking to this morning? Mm -hmm. Who here doubts the power of Christ to supply your need? We act like he's got to have this, that, and the other. This has to be in place before he can act. He ran out of what they had. But he never ran out of what he had. All right. I wish I had somebody in here with that. He has bread and enough to spare. For every soul that trusts in him. I know we're weak. I know we're corrupt. I know we're empty. And I know we're in despair. But Jesus lives. Go to him in prayer this morning. Oh, God was pleased for all the fullness of the Godhead to dwell in him bodily. Colossians 1, 9. He kept breaking and handing out what was needed. So, he's handing out what was needed. They keep coming back to him and he keep constantly breaking and giving what he needs. You know what it says to us? Keep bringing your needs to Jesus. <laughs> Keep on bringing them. They be out. They come back to him. His hand's still full. Yes, he is. Oh my goodness. They be out. They come back to him. His hand's still full. Don't stop praying. Persevere in prayer. Keep bringing your needs back. To Jesus over and over again because Jesus is able. I gotta move on. Jesus is able. 
I want you to note another point of application here before I leave this verse. Many things have to be broken before they can be useful. That's just how it is, right? Uh, uh, breaking can be painful, but, but breaking is often necessary for us to be productive. And sometimes God has to break our stubborn will in order for us to be useful in his hands. Yes, sir. Yes. Have I got any warriors here? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. My Lord. That's us. That's how I got saved. That's him. That's what happened. He broke. Yes, he did. That's how he works in my life in sanctification. He keeps breaking. Have I got any words? What are you going through? It's difficult, right? God says, I'm breaking you. Because I'm going to use you. Just wheels and things come into being in his hand, but 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 no no note the carriers in the provision. Who are the carriers? Amen. Well, he broke and gave to them to his disciples mm -hmm. to set before his people. Mm -hmm. Now he told them, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Okay. He told them that he had compassion for the people mm -hmm. and he wanted to feed them. Now he uses them to participate in his compassion. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? Yes, it is. Now, 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 this is a sneak preview of their future role as, as feeding, soul feeding messengers of the life giving gospel, right? They, 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 they will soon be uh, preaching the bread of life to the whole world. But now, Right here, they're, they're commanded to serve the Lord by serving people. But weren't they doubtful? Yeah. <laughs> Don't miss this. There's so much here. Ooh -wee. Serving doesn't require perfection. Yes, yeah. sir. It requires a surrendered will. Right? They were doubtful, but they gave Jesus what they had, and he still used them. You know what? God is so sovereign. God is at work in us even when we fail. I told you I was going to tell you I, that I, was, I would tell you what does Jesus do with people who flop? <laughs> like you and I? You ever flunk one of his tests? Yes, oh, sir. We, we all flunk this week. Come on, let's get real. Come on, we all flunked at some time or another this week, didn't we? They constantly fail to understand what's happening. Jesus still works in and through them. God, oh my goodness, it's so amazing. God says, I still exercise my ministry in jars of clay. <laughs> We're finite, but God is infinite, right? God says, I still put my treasure in human beings. I still work through weak and inadequate people like you and I. Because even in my weakness, I find the strength and power of God. We fail, but God never fails. God is never wringing his hand and saying, Oh my goodness, they failed another one. What will I do? Never. God just keeps on working, doesn't he? Praise you, Lord. I want you to know the enabling of the disciples to serve you. This is interesting. Who are they serving? Gentiles. Yes. Aren't they Jews? 
they are. Gentiles. Aren't the Gentiles <laughs> considered dogs? That's right. That's right. They serve. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! That's Amen. Amen. Woo. Amen. Listen. They don't even like these people. That's right. All right, man. Let's get real, right? That's it. Gentiles. Mm. And there's something in them. Yes, sir. Look at this enablement. Mm. Jesus says, I will use you to serve people you would not marry to serve. That's right. You have no problem serving the 5,000 plus because that was Jewish territory. What about serving the Gentiles? Yes. <laughs> Jesus says, if you want to follow me and be conformed to my image, you've got to have the compassion, not just for people in your group. Hug on home. Right? You, you, you've got to have compassion for all, all ethnicities, all nationalities of people. You can't pick and choose. Who you desire to serve. Right? Amen. Jesus says, I didn't come just for Jews. I came from for every nation, kindred, and tongue, yeah. tribe, right? But Revelation 14, 6. He came to save people. From all types of people groups. Yes, he did. Look at the carriers. Are you a carrier? Yeah. You willing to bring what you have to Jesus? You willing? Surrender to him even when you fail. Yes, sir. And say, Lord, use me again. Woo. Let's be honest, okay? I'm coming to a close. All God has to work with All right. is a bunch of failures. <laughs> Come on now, let's be honest, right? That's it. That's all he has to work with. Yes, sir. You said, wait a minute now. He had guys like Paul. Well, Paul said, in me, Romans 7, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. Every time I desire to do good, evil is always present. All God has to work with is a bunch of failures. But thank God that God keeps working in failures. And where God gets through with all these failures that he's working in, they'll be what he wants us to be. We'll be right. I'm a carrier. And I don't mind telling you, I'm a failure. Time and time and time again. But God continues to keep working in me and to keep working through me and to keep using me. I fail and I surrender and I repent. I fail and I surrender and I repent. My whole life is a big life of repentance. Yes, Watch this, I'm hit you. If your life is not a life of repentance, you don't know Jesus. Amen. First John 1 John 1.9 Actually, confessing of sin is what must characterize true believers. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, confess in 1 John 1 9 is in the present tense if you continue to confess. Right? Better than yes, sir. Thank you, Lord. You see the carriers in the carrier? Amen. Thank you. All right. Carriers can't pick and choose who they carry his provision to, who they carry the gospel to. That's right. You got to carry it to whoever God providentially brings you to. <laughs> Lastly, the consuming of the provision. Verse 8 says, and they ate. And were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over. Seven baskets full. Did you say they were satisfied? Yes, sir. Look at Jesus. Just look at him. I, I, I have to show you this. Just look at him. They ate it, and he says, What? They were satisfied in verse 8? Yes, sir. In verse 4, the disciples answered him, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? In other words, they said, 
It's not enough bread here to satisfy these people. What does verse 8 say? Eight to satisfy. Disciples say there's not enough to satisfy. But Jesus says, I'm enough. I know you don't have enough. But Jesus says, I'm enough to satisfy. And I want to say to you this morning, you will find nothing satisfying unless you find it in Christ. And I'll tell you something else about your trial. No matter how unpleasant and painful it is, it will not be dissatisfying if you see Christ in it. I better say that one more time. No matter how pleasant and painful it is, it will not be dissatisfying if you see Christ in it. Right? See, when there's a conscious awareness of his presence, it'll sweeten the earthly bitterness of our trials. Mm, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Christ always brings satisfaction. So don't look anywhere else. Because you can't find satisfaction anywhere else unless you find it in Christ. Go ahead and get that high paid job. And watch it fail. Go ahead and get that good looking boy. And watch him fail. Go ahead and get that pretty girl. And watch her fail. Go ahead and move in that exclusive neighborhood. And watch it fail. Go ahead and get your Jordans and all of your uh, main brand stuff. And watch it fail. But glory be to God. Christ always satisfies. Christ never fails. I come hungry and I come thirsty and I always get satisfied. Trust, trust Jesus today. Amen. Amen. Can I show you one more thing? They were satisfied, right? 4,000, and Matthew says in Matthew 15, it was actually 4,000 men plus women and children. Mm -hmm. You know, Mark is a fast paced guy. He says 4,000. <laughs> this was a huge crowd. I wonder, or do, or do, or do you wonder, did Jesus create more here in this miracle than he did? in the first feeding. Because they didn't learn his sufficiency in the first feeding. The disciples didn't. Because if they had, they wouldn't be asking, where are you bread in this desolate place? Right? I need to stand still, don't I? Oh, brother, don't I? Where are we going to get bread? In this desolate place. I keep saying I'm going to adjust the camera. So I keep moving, but I'm just going to hold on right here. Glory to God. They had seven baskets full. The first feeding, they had 12 baskets left over. This one, they had seven baskets left over. I would argue from this text that Jesus actually brought more into creation this time than he did in the first feeding. So, okay, Pastor, I know you said you weren't good at math, but now I believe you. Because everybody knows 12 is more than seven. That's right. Everybody knows that, right? Because you have, to, you have to get seven plus five to get to 12. So that means seven is five less than 12. Right? Here's where, here, here's one reason, you know, you, you don't need to go to seminary and, and go to Greek class and stuff like I did. You know, that, that's, a pre, that's a preacher thing, all right? But I would tell you, you, you ought to get your good lexicon and learn how to use it. Because the difference it's in the Greek word used for baskets. Yeah. The word back in Mark 6, 
for baskets. That word refers to a small basket sufficient for one person. Okay? Yes, sir. It's a different Greek word here for basket. This word basket here refers to a basket large enough to hold a human being. How do I know that? Because the same word is used for basket in Acts 9 26 when they put Paul in a basket and lowered him down the outer walls of the city of Jerusalem when he needed to make a quick escape. That's the same word that's used here. So this was a basket large enough to hold a human being. The other basket in Mark 6 is a basket that's sufficient for one person's lunch. Hmm. So you know what? Seven baskets full was equivalent to several hundred pounds of food. Is anybody here with me? Yeah. And you know what he's arguing about Christ? His sufficiency. Yes, sir. I'll just go home with this, right? Whenever God is in it, I want you to notice something. I'm sorry, darling. I got to walk on this way. Whenever God is in it, there's always a surplus. Have I got any more? You see? It wasn't just enough. Just enough doesn't mean sufficiency. It wasn't just enough to feed them. It was more than enough. It was God's sufficiency because God says, when I supply, I always have a surplus. When your power is exhausted, Christ says, you better remember mine is not. Oh, God gave us elastic like souls designed to eat more and more and more. And watch this, none of us have ever eaten all that he's able to give. Right? None of us have. But Jesus is saying, you need to see something here. I am sufficient. I'm not just enough for you, I'm more than enough. Right? <laughs> do I have any warriors here? Oh, do I have any warriors here? Remember my mom said, I don't know how I'm going to make it. She calls my dad Eddie. I don't know how I'm going to make it without Eddie. I said, Mom, Jesus is more. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Come on. Jesus is more than enough. Right? That's why when he says, come to my throne of grace, you can always find grace and mercy to help in times of need. Don't you put grace in a little box. Grace is all sufficient. Grace is always more than enough. It's an exhaustion. I did. Jesus says, in the second test, in the second lesson, I did more than I did in the first. <laughs> I wonder what they did with several, several hundred pounds of food. People went on to have to buy groceries and stuff. Yeah. See the relatives saying, where did you get all that from? Uh, you been to the marketplace? No, actually, we were out in a desolate place and we had uh, seven loaves and a few fish, and Jesus gave us this from that. <laughs> That's just how he is, isn't it? Yes. Amen. When did he supply what they needed? According to verse 3, when they would have fainted. Let me give you that one quietly. I guess. When did he supply what they needed? When they would have fainted. <laughs> when they're reduced to absolute dependence upon him, he stepped in. Right? When did he supply what they needed? 
when they came to the end of themselves. Watch this, when like the songwriter said, nothing else could help. When they had to trust solely and be, have faith solely in Christ alone. Am I talking to somebody in here that needs to be saved? Pastor, you're preaching to me. And I find out today that I'm utterly helpless and hopeless. And I'm at the end of all of my resources. I can't get better. I'm just ruined. Good place. That's when grace helps you. That's when you experience and receive the grace of God in your life. When you're about to faint. Yeah. And watch this. We Christians know that, don't we? Yeah. We know God sometimes brings us to the point where we're like, I just throw my hands up. I'm, I'm about to faint. I don't know what to do. I don't know which way to turn. Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No, that I know. If that's you. I know I've been saved since 83. It's been me multiple times since I've been saved. Put your faith in Jesus. Put your trust in Jesus. If you're not saved today, the problem is not what you do, the problem is who you are. Your whole life is wrong. Because you're sinful. It's not that you need to just stop doing what you're doing. That's not salvation. You need a new heart. Yes. Amen. You need to be changed from the inside. And nobody can change or touch you on the inside but Jesus Christ. He always satisfies. Put your trust in the person of Christ. Fully God, fully man in the work of Christ. Perfect obedience, perfect sacrifice, absorb the wrath of God on your behalf, judged for you, all of your sins, past, present, and future, judged right there at Calvary, raised for your justification on the third day, and ascended back to the Father, sent the Holy Spirit, whom you need right now, and I'm praying that he will send you the Holy Spirit right now. Put your faith in Christ alone. Lose your life, you'll find new life. But I tell you what, if you don't, you'll never be satisfied. You'll never be satisfied. You're looking at a satisfied man who have drank from the fountain of his sufficiency. And I am what I am by his grace. And he's not done with me. But I hope you're around when it does get finished. And watch what you see. <laughs> I shall come forth as pure gold. Thank God for our compassionate, wonderful, faithful, loving, extremely patient saint. Amen. May God get glory. Yes. Let's stand. Don't worry about coming up, Sister Christian. Don't worry about it. We love you. Let's pray for God's grace and application of this word to our lives. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much. Again, you have spoken to us. Our hearts burn, but our hearts also rejoice. Yes. I am so glad to be used by you. Mm, bless your holy name. I'm so glad to be saved by you, kept by you, sustained by you, to have you at work in us. Oh my God. Thank you. 
thank you for being so compassionate, so merciful. <clears throat> Father, sometimes we see you so wrongly, especially when we sin. We see you as this old grouch sometimes with your hands folded in your back time. You turn your back one time. And that was on your side. So that you would never have to turn your back. We praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. On us. Amen. And we can embrace every promise. Yes. We know you're with us always. We know that you're causing all things to work for our good, to bring us into conformity to the image of Christ. We know every sweet promise of Scripture is ours for keeps. And we know one glad morning when this life is over. Yes, hallelujah. We'll fly away to be at rest. So we give you thanks. Thank you for your word. Lord, we know a trial's coming, or we in a trial. Lord, help us to take what you preach through your servant and apply it to our lives. Help all of us, Lord, those who are not in trials. We need this word. We just need a period, Father. Help us, dear God. We want to live to the honor and the glory of Christ. So I pray that your word would dwell richly in us for, our, for fruit bearing, for your glory. I pray for anyone that is not saved. Jesus, you are the Savior, the only Savior. Not one of many. You are the way. You are the truth. You are the life. That's what you proclaimed. No man can come to the Father except through you. I pray for your saving grace. Be merciful some sinner or sinners that know not Christ. Be merciful. Lord, I know you're, you will do that and more. Because you're so full of compassion. So I give you glory. I give you thanks. We're departing from this place, but certainly not from your presence. Oh Lord, again I ask for your remembrance of everyone who is suffering sickness. Upcoming surgeries of Nakia and Brother Walker. Traveling mercy for Mother Swafford. We just needy, 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 but you're just giving, giving, giving. Now may your grace and the sweet, sweet, sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with your precious people now and forevermore. Let all the redeemed of the Lord say with me, Amen. Amen. Shake somebody's hand. Amen.